In the mid-1800s, several monumental problems surfaced as a result of recent land acquisitions by the United States. Of these difficulties, none seemed more insurmountable than that of slavery. In 1850, the issue of whether slavery would be established in the newly acquired Western Territory pitted the North against the South and nearly brought the country to war with itself. Henry Clay's speech to the House of Representatives on February 6, 1850 appeared to address and solve a prominent problem at the time, but it truly only postponed the divisive effects of slavery because such a compromise could not bring finality to such a tempestuous issue. Henry Clay was an experienced statesman who was born in Virginia and later moved to Kentucky. He served several terms in both the House of Representatives and the Senate in the first half of the 19th century. While he failed to ever get elected as president, Clay held the position of Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams' administration. His great oratory capabilities and the bills he helped organize throughout the two legislative chambers he earned him the nickname, the Great Compromiser. While Clay was a pragmatic man, the actions made throughout his life could be seen as somewhat paradoxical. For example, Clay was the leader of the War Hawks in his early congressional career, and advocated for war with Britain to gain land and dissuade foreign countries from continuing the policy of impressment, as impressment hurt the U.S. economy and damaged nationalism. Yet later on, Clay displayed strong opposition to the Mexican-American War because he realized that more territory would have posed even greater controversy over slavery. Clay's views on slavery were quite similarly split. He evidently worked to abolish slavery, while also occasionally arguing in favor of slavery existing in new states, presenting a perplexing duality. While Clay was a slaveholder, he advocated for progressive emancipation. In Clay's will, is recorded that he willed his 50 slaves to members of his family with the caveat that all of their children born after the start of 1850 be transported to Liberia and freed. Additionally, Clay helped found the American Colonization Society in 1816, which argued for slaves to be returned to Africa. Clay also worked to create the Missouri Compromise in 1820, which helped solve the problem of whether there would be slavery in the Louisiana Purchase. The issue of slavery had not been addressed at such a depth up until this point, which begs the question as to why 1850 was the year during which the major crisis took place. During this period, the creation of new states often came with inextricable ties to the debates over slavery. Only this time, the debate concerned a vast amount of territory with an extremely rapidly growing population behind it. The land accrued from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo included Texas with the boundary at the Rio Grande, California, which at that time included most of New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and fractions of Wyoming and Colorado. Part of the reason for that massive exodus westward, which resulted in a rapidly growing population, was the California gold rush. To put the enormous size of migration in perspective, 80,000 gold prospectors made their way to San Francisco in the year 1849. This spared hope for many Americans and also forced an answer as to whether slavery would be allowed in these new territories. Additionally, new political parties for slavery to be discussed. The Free Soil Party advocated for the creation of free states in the new territory. Also, the Liberty Party was an early abolitionist party that contested for the emancipation of all slaves, even Clay's own party, the Whigs felt the full estranging effects of slavery. The Whigs split in the 1850s into the Cotton Whigs and the Conscious Whigs, who supported and disapproved of slavery, respectively. The North, in general, consisted of those opposed to slavery, as they had little need for it, while the South mainly supported slavery as they offered economic benefits. The Northerners in 1850 pushed for the new states of California, New Mexico, and Utah to be free states. This meant the power of the Senate swayed in favor of the free states, which led to the possibility of the abolition of slavery. Consequently, several southern states, such as South Carolina, threatened secession if California, New Mexico, and Utah were admitted as free states, since their representation would be dwarfed even further, leading to a lesser say in the government of the Union. Henry Clay, as a senator at the time, sensed the growing state of disunion with the country. Therefore, Clay proposed a series of provisions known as the Compromise of 1850, to Clay, the crisis was not merely about the preservation or discontinuance of slavery. He valued the preservation of the Union above all else. The terms of the compromise as Clay created them include eight separate proposals. He grouped the first six into twos so that each group had a benefit for the North and the South. They included California being admitted as a free state with the rest of the unorganized territory being void of slavery restrictions. They had the popular sovereignty option. The United States, assuming the debt of Texas that it held prior to its annexation, in order to offset the U.S. border being set at the Rio Grande, 
and then the slave trade would be abolished in the District of Columbia, but slavery would continue to exist there unless both Maryland and Virginia consented to abolition. Clay later created two additional provisions to appeal to the South, since the first six clearly aided the North. The two added conditions state that Congress had no jurisdiction over interstate slave trade, and the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 would be stringently enforced. Clay specifically advocated for the passage of his compromise to the House of Representatives on February 6 of 1850. He began the speech by mentioning the great accomplishments of the country and sheer vastness the country had come grown to encompass. When he went into detail about the greatness that the United States equated to, he essentially urged the United States to continue its nationalistic sentiments rather than turning to sectionalism and disunion. Clay then very subtly attacked President Zachary Taylor. With respect to the one in command of an important portion of our army, I need say nothing in praise of him who has been borne by the voice of his country to the highest station in it, mainly on account of his glorious military career. Clay's distaste for Taylor was apparent, given that he refused to comment upon Taylor, yet Clay commented that Taylor was elected mainly on account of his reputation as a war hero from the Mexican-American War and never truly held any political prowess. Clay's source of resentment towards Taylor likely originated from Taylor's opposition to the compromise Clay had planned. After these statements, his speech quickly changed tone and portrayed the State of the Union. We are told now, and it is wrong throughout the entire country, that the Union is threatened with subversion and destruction. While the first question which naturally arises is, supposing the Union to be dissolved, having all the causes of grievance which are complained of, and how far will dissolution furnish a remedy for those grievances? If the Union is to be dissolved for any existing causes, it will be dissolved because slavery is interdicted or not allowed to be introduced into the ceded territories, because slavery is threatened to be abolished in the District of Columbia, and because fugitive slaves are not returned, as in my opinion they ought to be, and restored to their masters. These, I believe, will be the causes, if there be any causes, which can lead to the direful event to which I have referred. In this excerpt, Clay emphasized that the Union was in a critical condition, one that needed to be handled very carefully. Clay brought up the provisions of his compromise that he believed, if not ratified, would lead to the secession. He realized that the prohibition of slavery in the land acquired from the Mexican-American War, abolition of the slave trade in the District of Columbia, and the lack of adherence to the Fugitive Slave Act all provide ample cause for the secession of southern states. Clay further questioned what would actually result from secession when he said that separation from the Republic would not solve any problems they currently held. Separation would only have led to increasingly strained ties between the United States and the seceded states. It would have been illogical because secession would mean it would only have been harder for them to retrieve fugitive slaves, and the newly declared free states would have remained free states, which almost entirely negated the purpose of secession. Later on, Clay mentioned the negative impact that secession would have had on the country. Somewhat jokingly, he said that secession would have created a dangerous precedent that allowed for states to cede whenever they had a differing opinion from the majority of the country. The argument of the dangerous precedent it would have created directly relates to both Virginia and the Kentucky resolutions and the nullification crisis because in both circumstances the states tried to nullify federal law. The precedent this would have created would mean that any state, when they felt inclined to, could declare a federal law null and void, much in the same way if one state seceded, it would only encourage other states to secede. Clay also made a plea for the future of the country, which stated, I think that the Constitution of the 13 states was made not merely for the generation which then existed, but for posterity undefined, unlimited, and permanent, and perpetual. For their posterity, and for every subsequent state which might come into the Union, binding themselves by that indissoluble bond. Clay reasoned that it was not up for the states to decide whether or not to secede, because that was not an option in the first place. Their secession would amount to an irrevocable blow to the United States, when that essentially removed all meaning from the word united. The seceded states might also be unable to merge with the United States again, even if they had wanted to in the future. Clay also likens this union to marriage, a bond that is not meant to be broken. Following the statements, Clay said that a compromise was best for the parties involved. And what would be its termination? Standing armies and navies to an extent draining the revenues of each portion of the severed empire would be created. Exterminating wars would follow, not a war of two nor of three years, but of interminable duration. An exterminating war would follow until some Philip or Alexander, some Caesar or Napoleon, would rise to cut the Gordian knot and solve the problem of the capacity of man for self-government and crush the liberties of both the severed portions of the Union.
This portion of Clay's speech underlined the utter destruction that would result from the war which would have certainly followed secession. Clay felt that the war between the two entities would have been so fierce that neither side would have surrendered, draining both sides entirely of resources. Clay explained that an absolute ruler would then fill the power vacuum resulting from the war, which produces a substantially worse situation than the one they started with. These autocrats would destroy all that the United States had worked so hard to achieve by terminating the liberties of both sections of the Union. On the whole, Clay's document insisted that the enactment of the Compromise would be the best option to prevent the divisive effects of slavery. Luckily for the Compromise, Zachary Taylor died in July of 1850 and was replaced by Millard Fillmore of New York, a president who was all but opposed to the concept of Compromise. With that stroke of luck and Stephen Douglas campaigning on behalf of the Compromise, all the provisions of the Compromise had been passed in September of 1850. In the immediate future, the Compromise of 1850 had quieted the North and the South, but when examining the not-too-distant future, the Compromise of 1850 could be seen as a complete failure. Those that lived in the North often ignored the new fugitive slave law in every respect, even by aiding slaves in their escape. A number of Northerners felt that the fugitive slave law directly involved them in the conservation of slavery in America and regard the law as one-sided. Can the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 continued the policy of popular sovereignty in which the states would decide whether to allow slavery, effectively destroying the Mason-Dixon law. The vote to determine popular sovereignty resulted in several deaths and even a raid on Harper's Ferry by John Brown. The South and North grew even more skeptical of each other by the day. The two prominent political parties were also deeply affected by the growing tensions. The Whig Party subsided and was substituted for the Republican Party. Likewise, the Democrats were divided into factions of the North and South. At this point in the time, the Civil War was inevitable. The Compromise of 1850 was postponed, while the Civil War was finality, since it was truly a civil war that determined the fate of slavery in the United States once and for all.